Hello everyone. Good evening. I hope I am audible to you all. Okay. Uh, I welcome you all on this page, free of hope and care. And first of all, let me thank Dr. Abhishek Banerjee who invited me here to speak. And let me introduce you myself briefly. I am Dr. Ketki Chavan. I am an oral and maxillofacial surgeon practicing as a consultant in Pune. And from 1st June of this year, I started my own YouTube channel where I post simple animated videos especially for dentists and dental students. So do check them out once. And without further ado, let's begin with today's session which is handling complications that can happen during or after the extraction of a third molar. Now third molars are the most commonly impacted teeth and a complication rate of about 4.6 to 30.9% has been reported in the literature. Uh, so complications can happen even if you take a lot of care and I'm sure none of us would like to uh, share with our colleagues that complications are happening in their dental clinics. Uh, so that really prevents us from truly learning to handle the complications when they do happen. So we are going to talk about this uncomfortable subject today. Now let's look at the perioperative complications that can happen, meaning complications that can happen uh, during the surgery. So what do we do first? We give local anesthesia. Uh, so what complications can happen here is needle breakage. The reasons for this is if we use a thin needle, if the patient suddenly moves or if you bend the needle while giving the uh, local anesthesia. So these are the things that you should prevent. You should tell the patient that if uh, there is any discomfort then he should raise his hand and not to move suddenly and the hub is where the needle attaches to the syringe and that is the point which is uh, the weakest part of the needle where the needle can fracture and if you if you use a long needle uh, then it is easy to retrieve it because you will be able to see it when it breaks and you will be able to remove it Now what to do if the needle breaks? First of all, you should inform the patient that this has happened. And then if you can see it clearly, then you should try to remove it as soon as possible. And if you can't see it, then you need to refer the patient to an oral and maxillofacial surgeon so that in a hospital setting, uh, we will see the uh, needle in the 3D CT scan and then under general anesthesia, we can remove the needle. So for this, you will need a hospital setting. So that's why you need to refer the patient. Now, when we are removing bone to remove the impacted third molar, the complication that can happen is the burr can break. So this can happen when we use the same burr repeatedly because that, that can clearly change the metallic properties of the burr. So, what to do if the burr breaks? You should see it on the radiograph and localize it and then remove it at the same time that you are removing the tooth. Now imagine you are uh, elevated, elevating an impacted third molar and suddenly the adjacent tooth fractures. Have you ever had this kind of complication? I'm sure at least some of us must have had it at least some time in their dental career, maybe as a dental student. Uh, so you will be glad to know that the fracture of a crown, uh, uh, the fracture of the crown of the second molar when it has a large carious lesion or a large restoration is a common occurrence. So you are not the only one, but just because it is common, obviously that doesn't give us the license to fracture it, right? So, what to do to prevent being in this situation? You should, uh, you should take care that you never use the adjacent tooth as a fulcrum while elevating the impacted third molar. And preoperatively, you should check the condition of the second molar. 
uh, whether it has a large carious lesion, whether it has a large restoration. So that you can change your surgical approach and you can use forceps or you can section the tooth. So you will need to apply uh, less force while elevating the tooth. And on the radiograph, if you see that you need to remove a lot of bone to reach the impacted third molar, then you should tell the patient that the third molar might, the second molar might become mobile after the, after the surgery of the third molar. Now you will, uh, you might think that if I tell the patient this, the patient will lose his trust in my abilities. But communicating with the patient goes a long way in building trust with the patient and also for avoiding medical legal issues later on. And during the surgery, if the third molar, if the second molar does get partially avulsed or if it becomes mobile, then you can do interdental wiring to stabilize it for 40 to 60 days. And even after the 40 to 60 days, if there is pain on percussion of the second molar, then you should go for endodontic treatment of the second molar. Now another complication that is common uh, is bleeding. So it can be because of trauma to the blood vessels or it can be because of the patient's own medical history. Now we will see who is at risk of post extraction hemorrhage. So patients who have clotting factor deficiencies like hemophilia A, hemophilia B, von Willebrand's disease, acquired liver disease because liver is where most of the clotting factors are synthesized, then platelet deficiency, patients on anticoagulant therapy like warfarin. So you should take proper medical history uh, because it is very important. I would like to share something that happened with me when I was a dental student. I think uh, dental college is where we made a lot of mistakes and our senior professors had to come in and handle them to the complications that we caused. So in my case, there was a patient who ha had the problem of high blood pressure and she did not take medicines on that day and she did not tell me about her medical history that she has high blood pressure because she thought that if, I, uh, if she tells me this, then I will postpone the case and I should have recorded the BP first before extraction and that is my mistake. Uh, so what happened postoperatively is she came back with bleeding and then uh, our teacher had to handle that. He gave her tranexamic acid injection, which is an anti-fibrinolytic and it is used for the control of postoperative bleeding. So my point here is you should take proper medical history and record the blood pressure of the patient before starting with the case. Now, uh, what types of bleeding do you see after dental extraction? So normally if you see the just oozing and uh, blood tinged saliva, so that is not considered as post extraction bleeding. And sometimes patients get scared when they see uh, blood in their mouth, they think that the extraction socket is bleeding. So you need to counsel the patient that uh, this is normal. Now this is controlled by pressure packs. Then second, is post extraction bleeding so primary post extraction bleeding is the one that happens during and immediately after extraction and this can be controlled by techniques like pressure packing uh, then hemostatic agents and it is usually due to trauma to the blood vessels then reactionary post extraction bleeding is the one that happens two to three hours after, after extraction when the vasoconstrictor effect of the local anesthesia has worn off and it is usually if the patient has systemic conditions that we just talked about and this is not controlled by local measures like packing and it will require systemic interventions like tranexamic acid that we just talked about. Then secondary post of extraction bleeding is the one that usually happens that 7 to 10, 10 days post extraction and it is mainly due to secondary infection and fortunately it is rare in a dental extraction compared to the other two types of post extraction bleeding. 
Now the management of bleeding uh, starts right after you extracted the tooth. You should apply buccolingual digital pressure to close the uh, the socket. So that will that has an hemostatic action. And then you can use compression using gauze pack. This is something we all do. And most important is giving clear post-operative instructions. This sounds simple, but if the patient doesn't take care of the socket, then there can be secondary bleeding that can happen. Now, uh, if the bleeding doesn't stop after extraction, you can put bone wax in the bleeding bone cavity and uh, uh, apply it with pressure and then suture the wound and place the regular gauze back over it. If you can't close the wound margins, then you can use a gauze back over it and stabilize it using sutures. And instead of actually just using a gauze back, you can use hemostatic agents. Okay, so these are gel foam, surgical collagen and topical thrombin which can be used in combination with gel foam. So they rapidly arrest the hemorrhage. Now, the, now if the bleeding is because of a large uh, laceration of a large artery, then you have to ligate it. First, you will need to visualize where the bleeding is coming from and then uh, clamp the artery with the hemostat and then suture it and if you uh, if the vessel is very small then you need to use a narrow hemostat for clamping the vessel if you have electrocautery in your clinic then it is uh, very effective uh, for the control of bleeding electrocautery is a process where uh, we seal the exposed end of the vessel with the heat conduction Now the next complication that can happen during surgery is soft tissue injuries. So this can happen for many reasons. Sometimes what happens we use we are using an elevator and it accidentally slips and causes a lot of laceration. Uh, so if the if uh, the flap is traumatized, then what you can do is uh, you can cut the traumatized part and create a new tissue margin and then suture the wound. But of course, you should make sure that the base of the flap is wider than the apex because that is the basic surgical principle. Then if you use the retractor in the wrong way, like if the flap tissue gets trapped under the edge of the retractor, that can also result in soft tissue injuries. So you should always uh, keep the retractor's edge on the bone as you can see in this picture and if you use the retractor for prolonged periods and especially when the patient has a limited mouth opening then it can result in the injury to the lip commissures also so this is the picture that is showing the injury to the lip commissures that can happen so for this you should use Vaseline preoperatively and even after uh, the surgery is over you can tell the patient to apply Vaseline on the area where the injury has happened or you can use any uh, ointment of your choice. Now injury can also happen if as you know the handpiece can get very hot and it can injure the lip tissue so this is a picture of burn to the lip that has happened because of a hot handpiece uh, so you should always shield the lip tissue away from the handpiece many times when we are so focused on extraction we forget uh, about the soft tissues so you should take care here Now many times we have heard from our seniors and read in textbooks that we should always use controlled force while extracting a tooth. Why? Because if we, if we use abrupt force and sudden movements 
so that can result in fracture of the dento alveolar process as you can see here and especially in case of mandibular third molar you should take care that you don't fracture the lingual cortical plate because it can result in lingual nerve injury so what to do if the fracture does happen you should check if the fractured segment is loose meaning it is not attached to the overlying soft tissues and to the mucoperiosteum and so if it is small and if it is loose then you can remove it and then smoothen the remaining bone and suture the wound and if the fracture segment is still attached to the mucoperiosteum then you can just stabilize it and then suture the wound after irrigating the flap now just like uh, in the mandible even in the maxilla sudden movements and abrupt force can result in fracture of the maxillary tuberosity and especially when sometimes the third molar is ankylosed and uh, you apply force to remove it but it just won't move and then you apply even more force and then it fractures the maxillary tuberosity so what to do if it, if that happens first of all you should check if the fracture segment is still attached to the mucoperiosteum or not if it is still attached then you can stabilize it and then postpone the extraction for one and a half to two months during this time the fracture will heal and then you can remove the tooth surgically later on and if the fracture segment is uh, loose and if it has created an oroantral communication then you need to remove it and then give a tight figure of eight suturing so that the oroantral communication doesn't develop into an oroantral fistula now this is uh, not the only way that oroantral communication can take place it can also take place when sometimes the the root of the tooth uh, slips into the maxillary sinus so here in this radiograph you can see the root in the sinus so that can create an oroantral communication how do we prevent this from happening so you on the radiograph you should check if uh, the roots of the third molar are closed to the sinus or not and if they are closed and if you think that the oroantral communication is unavoidable then it is best to inform the patient that this complication might happen and after the surgery if you suspect that an oroantral communication has taken place how do you check for it so the first method is direct visualization here we uh, directly check if there is oroantral communication or not second method is using periodontal probe so with the periodontal probe you can gently uh, check the superior bony walls and the third method is called as valsalva test where you tell the patient where you first uh, first place the mirror intra orally so that you can view the extraction socket and then tell the patient to pinch his nose to close the nostrils and then blow gently through the nose and repeating the patient has to blow through the nose very gently because if he blows forcefully then even if an oroantral communication is not present before it can uh, create an oroantral communication so tell them to uh, blow through the nose very gently and if you see bubbles coming from the extraction site or if you see condensation of the mouth mirror then it can it, it indicates that an oroantral communication has taken place now let's uh, go to the treatment for part of this so if the oroantral uh, communication is small if it is less than 5 mm in the greatest diameter then you can put collagen plug or gel foam on it and then uh, give figure of 8 suturing and if it is large meaning it is larger than 5 mm then you should uh, refer the patient to oral and maxillofacial surgeon so that he can take different kinds of flaps and then suture the wound so for definitive closure of the wound you need to refer to an oral surgeon and 
while discharging the patient along with antibiotics you should give nasal decongestants because uh, that will shrink the nasal mucosa now in case of mandible uh, if you use a lot of lingually directed force when you are removing an, a, max, a mandibular third molar then the tooth or the root of the tooth can slip into the floor of the mouth and how do we manage that so you can use extra oral pressure along the lingual aspect of the mandible and try to push the tooth out into the oral cavity and when it comes out you can remove it and there is a risk of causing uh, a lingual nerve injury in this case but it is we can't leave the tooth in the floor of the mouth so we need to retrieve it and after the surgery you should monitor the patient for any floor of the mouth bleeding for any hematoma so if it happens you can manage it right away now this is the complication that i am most scared of uh, this is nerve injury because uh, it takes a long time to heal and the patients are very irritated and th that is understandable from the patient's point of view uh, and they co keep calling us like uh, when will this go away when will the numbness go away uh, so the nerve injuries can happen in about 1.3 to 5.3 percent of patients that are undergoing mandibular uh, in the surgery of mandibular impacted third molar so you should always include it in the informed consent that this is the risk that can happen and then inform the tell the patient and explain to him that it can happen now uh, here the uh, prevention is always better than cure uh, so you you should check on the radiograph if the roots of the third molar are close to the nerve or not so there are signs which are called as roots criteria so these signs tell us whether the uh, roots are very close to the nerve so what are these signs the, the signs that we see in the tooth root are darkening of the roots then deflection of the roots the roots suddenly get you know, narrowed or uh, bifid roots so that these are the signs and in the canal you see uh, interruption of the white line of the canal uh, the canal is going smoothly but suddenly it diverges or the canal suddenly gets narrowed near the root so these are the signs that you should check on the radiograph so after checking these signs uh, if you feel that the roots are very close to the nerve then there is a new technique which is called as coronectomy where you can remove the crown part and leave the roots behind uh, and after a while the roots means after a few months the roots might migrate into the oral cavity and require second surgery to remove them but now it will be away from the inferior alveolar nerve so this has been uh, studied for over 15 years and it has found to be safe in the long term so this is a good way to prevent inferior alveolar nerve injury and if the patient complains of uh, numbness after the surgery uh, then we can give neurobion forte which is vitamin b complex and this helps in faster return of sensation and even after nine months to one year if the patient is still complaining of any neurosensory deficit then it is likely to be permanent Now let's talk about the post operative complications if you are not bored okay uh, so what do we see after surgery lot of pain lot of swelling and that can result in limited mouth opening which is called as prismus so the management of this actually depends on the cause of it so if the prismus is because of hematoma then you can tell the patient to do warm water rinses and also apply hot cloth extra orally for about 20 minutes every hour until the symptoms decrease in the severity so this is uh, called as heat therapy and the trismus can also occur because of injury to the medial pterygoid muscle uh, when we give repeated blocks of the inferior alveolar nerve this is the management of trismus heat therapy that we just talked about then 
gentle massage of the DMJ also helps. Of course, analgesics and muscle relaxants can be given and physiotherapy is very effective. So you can tell the patient to do uh, mouth opening exercises like open and close the mouth, do the lateral movements also for about three to five minutes every three to five hours. So that can really help in increasing the mouth opening. Next complication is hematoma. So hematoma is basically blood accumulating under the tissues and there is no way for the blood to come out uh, because the wound is tightly sutured. Uh, so if hematoma happens in the first 24 hours after the surgery, you should tell the patient to apply ice packs extra orally and after that the patient can start with the heat therapy. So that will reduce it. Now. Uh, because of some complications that happen during the surgery, post-operative complications can happen. For example, if during the surgery there is a lot of soft tissue injury, then post-operatively edema can uh, happen. So if there is a lot of soft tissue injury, the severity of edema will be also more. So normally the swelling reaches a maximum in about uh, 72 hours and then it starts to decrease on the third and the fourth post-operative day. So if the edema is small, then it doesn't uh, require any uh, treatment as such. But if it is large, then there is a risk of causing fibrosis. So uh, you should give anti, you should give fibrinolytic medications for this. And for prevention purposes, after, right after surgery, you can give ice pack to the patient to apply extra orally. So that will reduce the post-operative edema. Now, corticosteroids uh, have been proven to have a good effect on edema. So direct injection of the steroid into the musculature had the best effect in reducing post-operative swelling according to some studies. And another study that analyzed the effect of preoperative submucosal uses of dexamethasone on the swelling. So they found out that this injection was very effective in reducing these post-operative conditions. Now cryotherapy is basically applying cold packs. So this is therapeutic use of cold applied for reducing the skin and subcutaneous tissue temperature. But there are some contraindications. So you cannot use this in patients who have peripheral vascular disease or cold, intoler uh, cold intolerance as in a Raynaud's phenomenon and in areas that are that have impaired circulation. Now high low therapy is something new. Uh, so this is uh, basically uh, like cold packs but here it, you can control the temperature. So this is a preformed polyurethane mask and you can control uh, the temperature for as long as you want and I'm not saying you have to buy this machine but uh, I'm just including it for education purposes. Now edema is not, uh, edema is something you should not take lightly because if it is spreading to pharyngomaxillary area then it can cause asphyxia and the patient will be not, uh, patient will be unable to breathe. So in, the, in that case you should give hydrocortisone to 50 to 500 milligrams intravenously because that has a rapid action. Uh, now after two to three days of extraction, the complication that we commonly see is dry sockets. So the incidence in routine extraction is about 3% and for mandibular thermolas, it is reaching over 30%. So that is quite high. Now the management part, we all know that we give uh, saline irrigation, we give uh, zinc oxide eugenol pack in the socket and alveogel paste which has eugenol, idoform and uh, butambin. It is not seen here because of this picture. Uh, then there is dextra, dextrosin. This is a new thing. So this is better than zinc oxide eugenol because zinc oxide eugenol is shown to um, Create, have foreign body re reactions and in case of dextrosin and collagen paste you don't see that. So dextrosin is basically dextranumer granules and uh, how it helps is 
it absorbs the wound exudate and also reduces the inflammation in that area so this is how it helps in wound healing also collagen doesn't have a foreign body reaction uh, it attracts fibroblast it creates a scaffold uh, where the wound healing can take place so collagen paste and dextrosin are better Now we are coming near the end of our session and the last one uh, that I would like to talk about is infection. Fortunately it is rare because we all use antibiotics but if the wound is infected how will you know that is it is infected? So there are signs. So normally you know that the swelling reaches its maximum in 72 hours and then it goes on decreasing. But if the wound is infected. Uh, the swelling will increase even after 72 hours and there will be increase in pain there will be extra oral erythema fever so these are all the signs that tell you that the wound is infected and if there is acute infection you need to drain that area so for doing that you need to remove the sutures and irrigate under the flap and then give antibiotics for seven days So this topic of complications is actually very big and uh, I tried to cover uh, all the most common complications and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this session and I thank you all for joining me today this evening for taking the time out to come and listen to me speak and I hope you will subscribe to my channel which is uh, Toothism and follow this page and follow my page which is to, called as Toothism and let's grow this family and use social media to our advantage and I hope you have a great week ahead and hope to see you again and I thank, uh, I thank Dr. Abhishek Banerjee again for calling me here uh, okay bye